the world. He's traveling all around, and so we feel very privileged that he made Zurich a stop in his uh, journeys. And uh, we already had some some programs with him, and today actually this is already his going to be his fourth lecture. <laughs> so not only us, but so many people all around the world like to hear from him very much. So we're very very happy that March is here, and he will speak on Bhagavad Gita. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to Maharaj. We'll have some kirtan. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So thank you so much for coming on uh, this sunny Sunday afternoon to Zurich Temple. And uh, yeah, very honored to be here with you um, this evening or this afternoon. Uh, we have a little bit of time to discuss Bhagavad Gita. I had some thoughts in my mind, but I'm very happy and open to go with the flow. So um, while we're singing, if anything comes to your heart that you would like to know about or you'd like to ask about, then uh, I'll give you an opportunity right after to kind of share that and then Maybe we can go in that direction this afternoon. Uh, we'll keep it a little bit spontaneous and see, uh, see where it all goes. But um, I hope we'll have some nice uh, spiritual discussion together. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, so please do think about if you have something that's in your heart and mind. We could even do questions and answers. Let's see how it goes. Hare Krishna. Just one thing. You can all come a little closer so that there's more space in the back for us to come in later. And also, für diejenigen, die eine Übersetzung gerne hätten, das Deutsche, die werden da hinten in der Ecke. Wenn gerne darüber kommen. Um, is anyone here for the first time? Okay, wonderful, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. So uh, before we have a, usually some kind of discussion on spiritual subject matter, we do a little bit of singing. So we're going to sing this beautiful song. Um, uh, it's written in Sanskrit, which is an ancient language, often said to be the mother of all languages. And what it's doing is it's uh, depicting a picture of the eternal reality so maybe we'll touch on this today, but the Bhagavad Gita explains that this world that we're living in is a reflection. It's a reflection of another reality, an eternal reality, a spiritual reality. And in that reality, it said that every step is a dance, every word is a song, every act is an act of love. Um, and it's a place in which all desires are um, fulfilled to their unlimited extent. Um, so, yeah, if you know the words, you can sing along, and if not, you can enjoy the sound vibration, and we'll also sing a little bit of the Hare Krishna mantra. So, um, yeah. Oh, there's one there, yeah. That's up there. Hare Krishna. Radha Madhava Kunj Bihari Jana Valabha 
Shana, 
Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Hari Bol, Hari Bol, Hari Bol, Gora Hari Bol, 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 Prabhu Jaya Prabhu Shri Hari Nam Sankirtan Ki Oma Gyan Atimirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Shila Prabhupada Ki Chai <clears throat> Okay, so um, as mentioned, we have a little bit of time. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has anything specifically on their mind or a topic or a question or <laughs> something perhaps you would like to hear a little bit more about. I'm happy to take some uh, points from you. Um, and then I'll try to maybe answer that or share some reflections or weave that into the lecture because we want to say something that's relevant to you. So anything on anyone's mind, any question or any topic or anything? Regarding moksha. Regarding moksha, okay. Anything in specific? Well, nothing but tested how to get <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> Nothing in specific. We want to know how to get it. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar, moksha is a Sanskrit word, 
which means a liberation or release from the material world. So the gentleman here, your name, Prabhu? S.L. Maheshwari. S.L. Maheshwari is asking, uh, how do you get release from the material world? A very pertinent question. Very good, yes. I'll take some ideas and then I'll choose. <laughs> Did you want to share something? Yeah. yeah. Arjuna asks, not Krishna, I can control everything, but I can't control mine. Okay, how do we control the mind? It, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the mind can be the best friend or the worst enemy. The mind can make heaven out of hell or hell out of heaven. Uh, the mind can drive you crazy. Um, in one of our scriptures it said, the mind is like a drunk monkey bitten by a scorpion and haunted by a ghost. <laughs> Who can understand what such a monkey will do next? So the mind is so uncontrolled. Okay, so we got something about moksha, the mind, it seems M is like the common denominator here. Anything else, anyone? I'll try and weave it in, yeah. Okay. Sometimes I just don't know exactly what my duty is. So okay, cool. amazing. Okay, so what is our duty? Um, in the world, there's so much about um, purpose, isn't it? Finding your purpose. In Sanskrit, uh, purpose is known as dharma. You may have heard this word. It means the very essence of your being. So what is our dharma? What is our purpose? What is our duty? How do we know? Uh, great topic. Yeah. Um, I have some doubts sometimes as to does our destiny control us or we, are, we control our destiny? Okay, so how does uh, fate and free will, um, on one hand, is everything predestined? On another hand, is everything totally up to you? Uh, the law of attraction, uh, you know, uh, the secret. Um, you can attract whatever you want by your free will. Uh, where do we lie on that scale? Okay, good. I'm getting a sense. I'm just trying to tune into your vibration. Um, so let me say a few things and I'll try and tie in um, these four points. Moksha, the mind, and dharma, and uh, karma. In Sanskrit, moksha, mana, Dharma and karma. They all rhyme. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll come back to a verse from the Gita. Let me begin with something. Did you know that each of us interact with five worlds? Do you know that? I'll tell you the five worlds. And then I'm going to ask you which is the most important world. The first world we interact with is the world around us, isn't it? You live in this world, there are so many places, there are 500 major cities, seven continents, so many villages, there's so many places, there's so many people, there's so many cultures, there's so many different political situations, there's so many different opinions. This world is a busy place. So the first world you live in, welcome, is this material world the world that surrounds us. The second world is the world that you choose, isn't it? There are so many people in this world, seven billion people, but you can choose to some extent which people you want to live with. There are so many places to live in this world, but you all chose Zurich. Good choice. <laughs> Uh, there are so many opinions you can ascribe to, so many worldviews, but you chose one. Right? There are so many um, lifestyles that you could have adopted, but you adopted a certain lifestyle. Maybe you decided to be vegetarian, or maybe you decided to be vegan, or maybe you decided to be ahimsa vegetarian, which is, uh, I'll tell you about that later. Second world is the world that you choose. Agreed? So now you know there are two worlds. But did you know there's a third world we live in? That's the world inside of you. Did you know they say the story of the world today is 
smiling faces, crying hearts. Because the world inside of you is an invisible world. It's not a world that everyone sees. It's the world that you experience day to day. Your feelings, your emotions, your consciousness, your hopes, your fears, your perceptions. This is the world inside of you. The fourth world is the world that you can change. Put your hands up if you'd like to change something in the world. Yeah, the world needs a lot of change makers. Yeah, there's a part of the world that we go out and we change. Did you know you have more power and influence than you think? There's one English poet, his name's Dunn. He writes, no man or no woman is a social island. When we're in this world, we're always affecting other people, affecting our environment. We're making a change. Some people do it consciously, some people do it unconsciously. I have a dream. We all have a dream to change the world. That's the fourth world you interact with, the world you want to change. And you know the fifth world we interact with? That's the world that you're destined for. The world that you're creating for the future. The world that you'll have to live in 10, 20, 30 years down the line. Maybe the world you'll live in after this life, if you believe in reincarnation. Can you now see the five worlds? The world that surrounds you, the world you choose, the world inside of you, the world you can change, and the world that you're destined for. Now my question to you is, the 64 million Swiss franc, is it? Swiss franc? Million dollar question. Which is the most important world? Is that an answer? <laughs> what do you think is the most, which, which of these five worlds would you say is the most important world for you to focus on? Yeah. I think where are you going to live? Okay, so you're saying the second world, the world you choose, is the most important world. No, I mean the world. The world you want to change? Uh, no, where you oh, where you're going to live in the future? Yes. Oh, the, the world you're destined for? The fifth world. Okay, so you're saying, here we got a taker for the fifth world, yes. I think uh, the most important world is uh, the world in yourself. The world inside of you, and why do you say that? Because uh, everything, uh, because the world we view comes from inside us. Okay, so you're saying the inner world is the most important. Does anyone here have a different idea to those two? Is there a right answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're coming to that. Ojo, <laughs> oh, we're coming to that. <laughs> I first I want to see where you're going with this. Yeah. No, I just want to add that I agree it's the one inside us. Uh -huh. Because it's the I think it's the one that uh, you know has like a kind of uh, affects all the others because the one inside us, the, the, the world inside us. Of as an impact on the world we live, the world we choose, the world we want to change, and also the world that is destined for us. So I think from the, I mean, I don't know if it's true or it's right, but I think the one that comes from inside us has a, an impact on all that. Okay, thank you. Yes, very good. Um, any last thoughts before I move on? No one has a different opinion, so we've only got the world inside and the future world. No one thinks the other worlds are important, as the most important. Well, yeah. I think it just all starts inside here. So you're saying, yeah, the third world, the world inside you, it's all what's inside, yeah. Okay. Actually, there's no right answer. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for that. Um, because each of these worlds are important. How can we say the world around us isn't important? It, we live in this world. We're so influenced by this world. Um, how can we say the world inside of us is not important? That's the world which accompanies us, the lens through which we see everything. 
How can we say the world that we want to change is not important? That's where we're going to leave our legacy, our lasting contribution. How can we say the future world, that's our reality that we're going to be transferred to? However, today, what I'll share with you is that perhaps the world that we need to focus on most out of all of these five worlds is the world that we choose. And why do I say that? Because according to the world that you choose for yourself, it will affect the world inside of you. And according to the world inside of you, you will then become empowered in trying to change the world that you want to change. And according to how you make a contribution, that will then affect your future world, the world that you're destined for. So what we could make an argument that from the Bhagavad Gita, what Krishna is basically equipping you to do is create a beautiful life for yourself. Choose a beautiful life. Why are all these pages of wisdom here? Because all of these pages of wisdom are meant to help us make the best choices, make the best decisions, create the best uh, life for ourselves. Um, because based on the world that we choose to live in, um, every other world will be created outside of that. So that's one way in which you can approach this. And what Krishna does in the Bhagavad Gita is that Krishna explains, you can say broadly, five things which make up a beautiful life. And if we incorporate these five things within our life, then we will create a beautiful world that we choose to live in, and then all other worlds will become beautified because of that. But in order to know these five things, we have to access this wisdom. Therefore, this knowledge is very, very powerful. I'm just going to read for you a verse from the, 38, uh, from the fourth chapter, verse number 38. And this is what Krishna says in Sanskrit, this is how he says it. Nahi jnanena sadrisham pavitram iha vidyate tatsvayam yogasam siddha kale naatmani vindati Krishna says, in this world there is nothing so sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge. Such knowledge is the mature fruit of all mysticism and one who has become accomplished in the practice of devotion, enjoys this knowledge within himself in due course of time. And there's a commentary on every verse which is given by Srila Prabhupada. So it's a short commentary, so I'll just read that so you get a taste. When we speak of transcendental knowledge, we do so in terms of spiritual understanding. As such, there is nothing so sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge. Ignorance is the cause of our bondage, and knowledge is the cause of our liberation. This knowledge is the mature fruit of devotional service, and when one is situated in transcendental knowledge, he need not search for peace anywhere else, for he enjoys peace within himself. In other words, this knowledge and peace culminate in Krishna consciousness, that is the last word in the Bhagavad Gita. So what Krishna is basically saying is that if you have knowledge, then you're able to make the right decisions to create a wonderful life for yourself. When you create a wonderful life for yourself, which is guided by knowledge, then immediately your inner world becomes very, very peaceful. And not just that, you then become empowered to do, um, uh, achieve your potential in this world. And therefore, today, I'm just going to share with you five points about broadly what make up a beautiful life. And then I'm going to try and tie in some of these points and, that you asked about, because I think they fit into this. If you want to know uh, the components of a beautiful life, if you want to know the components of what kind of world to choose for yourself, this is basically what Krishna says in the Gita. A beautiful life consists of, number one, beautiful character. A beautiful life, number two, consists of beautiful um, company. 
And number three, a beautiful life consists of beautiful culture. Number four, a beautiful life consists of a beautiful contribution. And number five, a beautiful life consists of beautiful connection. If you wanted to summarize what Krishna teaches in the Gita, this is one way you could summarize it. A beautiful life means beautiful character, beautiful culture, beautiful company, beautiful contribution, and beautiful connection. And it's, um, I haven't taken this from a TEDx talk or anything like that, but <laughs> just in case you want this. Uh, but this is basically one way to present what Krishna is teaching. And I'll just briefly say something about these things. The first thing Krishna says is that if we want to live a beautiful life, if we want to have a beautiful world, character is incredibly important. So many people in the world today have a to-do list. When they wake up in the morning, they have a list of things that they want to do, that they want to get done that they want to achieve in the world. But do you know, people in this world, they won't remember you for what you did, but they'll remember you for who you were. I do this exercise sometimes with groups. I ask them to close their eyes and think of someone really influential in their life. And then I ask them, what is it about them that captures your imagination? And do you know, it's never anything to do with their achievements, but it's all to do with the character that goes behind their achievements. As monks, when we entered the monastery, we used to do one guided meditation. And what uh, one of our teachers used to do, crazy as it may sound, is he used to take us on a guided meditation and ask us to visualize our own funeral. And in your mind's eye, you visualize your own funeral. Who has come? What is the mood? Where is it? Can you identify the faces? And then in your guided meditation, he says, I want you to now visualize the person who comes to the front to give the eulogy, the speech of your life. So you picture the person. And then you have to try in your mind's eye to imagine what would you want that person to say about you. And the quality I appreciated in them most was dot dot dot. The way they made an impact to the world was by dot dot dot. Their greatest achievement in life was dot dot dot. And you had to write down how you'd want them to finish the statement. And then we'd come out of the meditation and we'd look at it and we'd ask ourselves, what did I do in the last month to become this person? And invariably we'd realize that we were so much focused on activities that we forgot it was all about the character. It was all about the deeper substance, the content of our own personality that ultimately we want people to remember us for. So, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita and on many, many occasions outlines the characteristics and the qualities of the most spiritually evolved people in the uh, creation. And these uh, uh, qualities are given to remind us that if you embrace such character, your life will always move in the right direction. If you embrace compassion, if you embrace truthfulness, if you embrace um, tolerance um, in appropriate ways, when these qualities are imbibed within our life, invariably life becomes beautiful. So the first thing Krishna teaches is that have beautiful character and think about character. Just Along with having a to-do list, have a to-be list. How many people have a to-be list? Right. Today, I want to to be this. Right. That is very, very important because that's what's going to leave a lasting impression in this world. The second thing Krishna talks about in the Bhagavad Gita is beautiful culture. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna outlines a model 
of lifestyle known as the three modes of material nature. Krishna explains that everything in this world is governed under three qualities, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Just like you have the three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. And these colors in mixing have unlimited varieties. So there are three basic principles which govern everything in this world. Goodness, passion, and ignorance. And Krishna explains that when you live a lifestyle, when you have a culture which is in the mode of goodness, then uh, it leads to a beautiful life. The food that you eat can be in the mode of goodness. If the food that you eat is fresh, uh, healthy, full of uh, nutrients, um, then it's in the mode of goodness. Whereas if you eat food which is stale, unhealthy, food which is imbalanced, food which you know, agitates, this is in uh, passion and ignorance. So everything in the world and everything you do can be in goodness, passion or ignorance. You can even drive in goodness, passion or ignorance. If you drive and you're kind of falling asleep, then that would be driving in ignorance. If you drive and you break all the speed limits and you know cut people up and go into fits of road rage, then that would be known as driving in passion. And uh, then you can imagine what driving in goodness is like. So everything can be in goodness, passion or ignorance. This is beautiful culture. Krishna is giving a whole delineation of how to live lifestyle. Then Krishna explains uh, beautiful company. We are basically a combination of the five people we associate with the most. So whoever we decide to spend the most time with, whoever we decide to bring in our proximity, uh, clearly um, their qualities will rub off on us. So Krishna explains what are the kind of friends to look for in this world. Um, sometimes we have a lot of toxic relationships in this world which really bring us down, which really limit us. And we're not able to identify toxic relationships and even if we are, we're not able to let go of them, knowing them to be unhelpful. So Krishna explains how to um, create a beautiful life by having beautiful company. And then Krishna talks about contribution. You see, we earn a living by what we get, but we earn a life by what we give to others. And so in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is talking about how selfless service to others, how um, making a sacrifice to bring about happiness in other people's lives, um, when one creates a life which is based on contribution. You see, the world we're living in today is a very selfish world. They call it the me society. Most people are only thinking about their own success, their own future, their own security. Um, but as one advances and one realizes that my success, my happiness is also based on the success and happiness of others. It's not that I'm just an individual person in this world and I'm in it for me. No, we're all connected. And as we help others to grow, when you help other people solve their problems, many of your problems disappear automatically. When you try to make other people happy, then your happiness comes about automatically. When you try to share wisdom to awaken people's consciousness, then you become even wiser automatically. In other words, we are, um, we are not just passive observers of others, but we have the opportunity to make a great contribution in their life. One German writer, he says, treat a person as he is, and he will remain as he is. But treat him as he can and should be, and he will become what he can and should be. In other words, we have the ability to make great contributions to other people's lives, great contribution to the world. And then Krishna says, the fifth and final thing that really makes a beautiful life is beautiful connection. And this perhaps is the bottom line of the Bhagavad Gita. 
The word yoga means to connect. Each one of us, deep inside of us, we seek connection, we seek relationship, we seek to experience a higher type of love that somehow seems elusive in all the relationships of this world. C.S. Lewis, the writer, once said, if I find within myself a desire which no experience of this world can fulfill, then I must conclude I was made for a different world. So it's kind of like that. We go through life and we experience so many things, but it doesn't quite satisfy the heart. There seems to always be some vacuum, no matter how successful, no matter how much we achieve, no matter how many of our goals we seem to meet, still we seem like uh, feeling there's something missing. And Krishna explains in that Bhagavad Gita that that missing part is yoga, connection, spiritual connection, connection with God. Um, an awakening of the self with the Supreme Self. Um, this is what the whole process of the Bhagavad Gita is about. And so here I'm just kind of laying some groundwork that there are five worlds in which we function. Yet the most important world is the world that we choose for ourselves. And if you choose a world in which you focus on beautiful character, beautiful culture, beautiful company, beautiful contribution and beautiful connection, your world becomes beautiful and all subsequent worlds become beautiful. The gentleman here asked about moksha, or how do we become liberated from this world? Well, by having a beautiful life, by acting in a beautiful way, then that's going to create a future world for you, a future world in which you free yourself from material influence. Moksha doesn't just mean to go to another world. That's what it means in an ultimate sense. But moksha means the ability to live in this world, but not be affected by this world. And you can only live in this world and not be affected by this world if you learn to elevate yourself beyond materialism. And so all of this knowledge is meant to help us elevate ourselves beyond um, this materialism that we're surrounded by. And then we live as a lotus in the middle of the uh, water, which is surrounded by water, but when one drop of water falls on it, it just slides off. So, by living a beautiful life, we attain uh, a certain immunity to this world. We walk down the world and we're not affected by it as we would previously be affected by things. Um, our own purity is our immunity. And then the lady here asked about the mind. Uh, how do we deal with the mind? Well, the mind becomes agitated because we get all of these things wrong. Because our character and our character traits are wrong, our mind becomes agitated. We become angry at certain things. We become envious towards certain things. Why do all these qualities agitate our mind. Our mind becomes agitated because we have unhelpful lifestyles. Our mind becomes agitated because we're surrounded by people who don't help us to cultivate a higher mindset. Uh, we become uh, affected so much about our mind because we're so centered on ourselves instead of contributing to others. And ultimately, we have an agitated mind because our mind hasn't connected itself to something higher. And so, by creating a beautiful life, automatically your mind will become controlled because all the things that agitate the mind will no longer um, affect you uh, in that way. The lady here asked about duty and purpose. And uh, the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is explaining that each one of us have a dharma. We have a dharma as a soul, and we also have a dharma according to this body that we have, and this personality that we have. And um, part of a beautiful contribution is understanding what is my dharma. And how do we find our dharma? Well, in books like the Bhagavad Gita, 
different archetypes of personality are given. And when we read these different archetypes of personality, then we begin to understand more about the kind of psychophysical nature that we have. And then we're better able to place ourselves in this world in a way of functioning in which we can achieve our potential. So the Bhagavad Gita contains wisdom in which you can understand more about your personality and more about how you can make your contribution in this world, your purpose in this world. And also the Bhagavad Gita contains knowledge about your purpose in the bigger journey of life. Because this life is just a chapter. And while we have to survive in this world, we also have to keep in mind that we have a deeper purpose beyond this world, beyond this body, beyond this chapter. And uh, the Bhagavad Gita helps us to be alert to both purposes, the purpose in this world and the purpose beyond the world. And then the gentleman asked about fate and free will. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that life is an interplay of fate and free will. Our fate is known as karma, and our free will is our ability to make decisions within that karmic situation. So say for example, when we are born in this world, we're born with a certain type of body, which has a certain amount of intellectual cognitive capacity. Of course we can expand it, but pretty much we're wired in a way we're wired. And so that's to some extent fate. You can't change, uh, you know, certain things. Some people are good at certain things, some people aren't. Those abilities to some extent are innate within us. So that's fate, that's karma, that we can't change. But what you can do is within that situation, you have decisions you can make. And according to the decisions that you make within that situation, you will create your future karma, or your future destiny, or your future fate. So how does Bhagavad Gita answer the question of fate and free will? It's an interplay of both. We are to some extent um, subject to a fate, a destiny, karma from previous life, but within that situation we also always have free will to design our future moving on from here yeah so these are some thoughts I'm sharing with you and at this point what I'll do is maybe just open it up and and maybe we can have some question and answers because I said a lot and just to see whether you have uh, any thoughts or any reflections uh, things you agree with maybe things you maybe don't agree with is also fine and we can have a little bit of a discussion so, would anyone like to uh, ask anything or uh, share some thought or um, like any clarification on anything I've uh, raised so far? Oh my God, this dancer. Yes. From the last point which you were telling about the faith and free will, mm -hmm. of course, uh, I don't want to be, go deeper into the, the Shastras, but just some past times, what we learn and what we hear uh, from the past times of the Lord, not going very back, but still starting from Jay and Vijay, they reincarnate themselves because of some past time, because of some mistake, they have to take three births as demons. Then we also talk about that uh, the, the great war of Mahabharata also happened eventually. So I was just wanted to know from this faith and free will uh, understanding which you gave us, that how much is the control? Because like if we see and really inspire us from these pastimes of the Lord, so we see that these biggest demonic things, which is there within us also, like this lust, greed, controlling the, the, the con my this controlling the world uh, these demons showed this qualities but they were being given empowerment by the Lord to, to come and show like this the, they were the servants of the Lord eternally in the beginning but they came and they did all these things 
So whenever something is happening around us, and we have to choose, and something is happening if we don't know why it is happening to us, is it also very much being planned by the Lord? This is how it should be happening to us. But I mean, if it's supposed to happen with us, then what is our Then what's the qu question of free will? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. <clears throat> you see, this uh, free will is never taken away by God or by Krishna. Because uh, free will is the one thing that's given, that's never taken away, because uh, ultimately we exist to exchange love with God, uh, love with other living entities. But there can be no question of love if there's no free will. If uh, free will is taken away and everything is forced by the will of God, then there's no love anymore because it's not voluntary, it's not by one's own volition. So free will is never taken away. However, in any given situation, we may limit our free will or awaken our free will according to our desire. Say for example, um, say for example, tomorrow I get drunk and I hit you with a bottle. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone arrests me <coughs> And then they say, well, it wasn't me, it was the alcohol. Yeah. Okay, right? So, is, am I right or wrong? Because I was drunk. And in, my, in a normal state, I would never do that. But I was drunk, and I hit you. Therefore, I didn't do it, the alcohol did it. It's not, it wasn't, so we, we, would they accept that? They wouldn't accept that. But it's true in one sense. It's actually true. But the point is, I initially used my free will to have all of that alcohol. And then later on, my free will became curtailed because of how I previously used my free will. And therefore, I now say, well, I'm doing things, but it's not my free will. But the point is, you behind that made a decision which curtailed your own free will. So remotely, it is your free will. So according to how we use our free will, then we limit our ability. You see, someone can pick up a packet of cigarettes, and on the cigarette packet, it says, smoking kills, smoking causes cancer. And while looking at that, someone will still pick up a cigarette and smoke it. Why? That means that their free will has been curtailed. But they're using their free will. Yeah, they have. But because of how they've used their free will previously, a certain level of addiction has taken place, which now means they can't make a logical decision in that situation as to what to do, rather than just an emotional decision. So the idea is that at any moment, by accessing knowledge, we can become aware of this. And then we can go back and change our character change our culture, change our company. And by changing these things, we increase our ability to really be free. Everyone, th everyone out there is walking around thinking they're free. Are they free? Real freedom means the ability to utilize your free will without being pushed by any of the influences of this world. How many people in this world are like that? Not many. So everyone thinks they're free, but they're not. So by accessing knowledge, you open up your capacity to utilize your free will. And then you make the best decisions. I hope that helps. Yeah, certainly. So just in the conclusion, uh, Maharaj, that we can say that, that all these past times what we have learned together, there was always a free will with Jaya and Vijay to choose to remain as a devotee for seven lifetimes or to choose to become a demon for three lifetimes. And for example, that was their free will, but even in that pastime, their free will was there when the Kumaras came. Yes. Yes. They, they, they could have let them through, or they could have, you know, why did they stop them? That was their free will at that point. And then they were then subjected to another set of this, you know, options based on how they use their free will. Yeah. After liberation, after coming out completely of the material world also, 
free will is still there. That is of course, the yes, problem. yes. Anyone else like to ask uh, any questions? Oh yes, you have a question. Go for it. When does Krishna? Die. When does Krishna die? Wow, amazing question. <laughs> Uh, Krishna never dies. Actually, no one ever dies. Did you know that? No one ever dies. Because the soul is eternal. Uh, even when you think someone dies in this world, then actually they haven't died because the soul has moved on. This body is a machine. It's like a dress. Like today you're wearing a, a white dress, isn't it? And tomorrow you may wear a blue dress. But you're still there, isn't it? Even though you change your dress, you're still the same person, isn't it? So similarly, the soul accepts different bodies. Um, and what we think is death is never death, because uh, the soul can never die. And in the same way, Krishna never dies. Uh, Krishna comes into this world at a certain point, and then Krishna disappears from this world at a certain point. Um, and when Krishna comes to this world, he shares knowledge, and then Krishna goes to another place. He leaves this world and shares knowledge somewhere else. Is that okay? Happy? <laughs> kind of. Okay, you can think about it. Let me know. Anyone? Finish? Yeah, we also have to leave. Okay, yeah, we're on to going uh, on to another place. So thank you so much. Some thoughts to share with you today. Uh, I hope some of that was useful and gives you some food for thought. And uh, hope to see you all again soon. Hare Krishna. Shila Prabhupada. Ki Jai. So in a Swayam Bhagavan Kesha Maharaj. Ki Jai. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for an inspiring lecture. And I'm sure we all have some food for thought to make our lives beautiful and uh, so right now there will be prashadam, beautiful prashadam also and uh, some free vegetarian feast for all of you prepared and if any of you are interested to try it out we just heard they can assist us here <laughs> we'll have uh, some fun in the kitchen at six o'clock also so whoever is inspired to help us do a little uh, service devotional service you're warmly invited and you can just approach me and we will nicely engage you. Thank you very much. Please stay as long as you can and enjoy the wonderful company here. And thank you for coming. Hare Krishna.